Hey you guys and welcome back to my videos. If you're new here, my name is Holly and thank you so so much for watching. By now I feel like you guys know the drill. My earrings are from my friend's little business called the Aurora Collective. It's She's got some really really good stuff on there. Heaps of earrings, candles, bath bombs, scrunchies, whatever you can imagine. I mean not whatever you can imagine but she's got a lot of stuff on there. So as always I will link her below. Please feel free to check her out. But you guys I'm going to try and get into this case pretty quickly. I'm filming kind of late today so I'm losing sunlight. So I guess without further ado let's get into it. So today I wanted to cover the case of the Easy Street Murders. This case involves the murder of two beautiful young women, one by the name of Suzanne Armstrong and also Susan Bartlett. Now Suzanne Armstrong was 28 and Susan Bartlett was 27. These two ladies' lives would sadly come to an end on the night of January 10th, 1977. But before we get to that part of the case, I want to talk a little bit about these ladies' lives and what they were like growing up. So these two girls grew up in a small country town which is called Benalla and Benalla is located about two and a half hours north of Melbourne CBD. These two girls started high school in 1962 and they became really really good friends when they were about 14. Because they went to the same school and they bonded over multiple things, these two girls were both the oldest of their siblings and they both also grew up in single parent homes and so they sort of bonded over that because in the 60s it wasn't as common for for people to have single parents and so I guess it was just something that they could talk about and relate to with each other. As well as this, they both really really loved the Beatles. And in June of 1964, the Beatles actually came to Australia to Melbourne to play. They were going to play at Festival Hall, which is a huge venue located in Melbourne CBD. And when Suzanne Armstrong and Susan Bartlett found out about this, they were determined to make it to that concert and see the Beatles live. Now, like I said, at the time, these girls probably would have been around 15 or 16 and they lived in Benalla. So it was going to take them two and a half hours to get to Melbourne to see the Beatles play. But they were determined. They were obsessed with the Beatles. There was no way they were going to miss it. So they took a bus all the way down to Melbourne to go to the concert. I feel like that's a pretty long trip for the girls to be making at that age. But I guess times were probably just a bit different back then. And it was kind of safer to go on trips at a young age. But in saying that, I also didn't read anywhere that they actually asked their parents if they could go. So maybe they did the classic, you know, staying at each other's house, but actually going to a concert. But both of these girls really, really loved to go on adventures. And I kind of get the feeling Armstrong was more of the ringleader and Bartlett was the one who was just happy to follow along for the ride. Because after they finished school in 1967, Armstrong saying true to the fact that she loved an adventure she moved straight to Melbourne she loved the busier lifestyle and had always said after school she was gonna move there and when Armstrong said something she stuck to it she was a woman of her word and Bartlett was not surprised when she made the move straight after school when in Melbourne she worked a series of jobs to save enough money up to be able to travel the world and this took her a few years, but by 1972, she had saved up enough money to set off on a adventure. She traveled all over, including the UK, Southeast Asia, and also America. By 1973, Armstrong was in Florida, America. She'd been traveling for about a year and she was starting to run out of funds. And this was a bit of a problem for Armstrong because she knew that she wasn't ready to go back to Australia. And so she spoke about this with a few people that she had recently met. She sort of asked around if there were any jobs that she could pick up to just earn a little bit of extra cash to help her be able to travel for a bit longer. And this is when a man who she had recently met at a house party told her that he had a job for her, that if she did, he would give her a good chunk of money. He said that he ran a business illegally importing emeralds from Colombia. And he said that he had a suitcase ready waiting for her in Colombia and if she flew over there, picked it up and took it back to America for him, he would give her the money that she wanted. Armstrong was pretty desperate for money and so she took this guy up on his offer and she set off to Colombia. When she got to Colombia though, she soon realized that the suitcase was not in fact filled with emeralds but it was filled with cocaine. Armstrong understandably freaked out but ultimately she decided 
that she wanted to take this case back to America. I get the feeling that she was more scared of the reaction she would get from this man when she came back empty handed than the potential risk of being arrested. And Armstrong was lucky enough to get back to America without any issues and she was relieved. But unfortunately for her, her troubles wouldn't end there. When she got back and asked to get her payment for bringing this guy the bag of coke, she got told that he wasn't going to pay her. I don't know how the conversation went down, but I can imagine she would have been really, really angry about the whole thing, but he just refused to pay her and she just had to let it slide. I guess you can't really go to the police about that sort of thing, really, can you? So she was in kind of a awkward position, but either way, I think the experience really shook her up and by the end of 1973, Armstrong returned back to Australia. Bartlett had also moved after school, but she didn't move as far as Armstrong. She had started working as an arts and crafts teacher in a local high school in a small town called Bradford. Bradford is about an hour 15 from Benalla and it's about halfway between Benalla and Melbourne. Susan Bartlett had a big family with at least one brother and sister that she was really, really close with. And I think that this played a part in why she didn't move as far. She did go and visit Armstrong often though in Melbourne before Armstrong went off on her travels overseas. And she was really inspired by Armstrong's travels to save up her own money and set off overseas on her own adventure. And she did. In late 1973, she set off to Greece. And she stayed there for quite some time. She was still traveling around the Greek islands in 1974. Now Armstrong was the one with FOMO. She had gone back to Melbourne and was working as a taxi driver, earning a little bit of money, but knew that she was happiest when she was traveling. So she saved up her money and in 1974, she had enough to set off to Greece to join Bartlett. The two girls were thrilled to be reunited as it had been a few years since they had actually last seen each other. And they continued to travel around the Greek islands together until early Early 1975 when Bartlett was the one to return back to Australia to continue working as a high school arts teacher. But this time, rather than returning to Broadford, she actually moved to Melbourne. The reason that Suzanne Armstrong didn't return with Susan Bartlett was actually because she found out while in Greece that she was in fact pregnant. She was pregnant to a Greek man whose name I was unable to find but for the sake of this video I'm gonna call him Elias. She met Elias during her travels and it seemed like she really wanted this relationship to work out. She really cared about him and Armstrong had grown up with separated parents and I feel like she just didn't want the same for her little baby. Although at first Armstrong really enjoyed the slower paced Greek island life she soon started to run into a few troubles. She struggled with a strict rules that pregnant people were expected to follow on the Greek islands and after her baby was born in August of 1975 she found that her and Elias's relationship was starting to fall apart. He seemed to become distant with both her and their baby Greg and so Armstrong decided that when she was going to return to Australia at the end of 1976 for Christmas she just wouldn't return. So Susan Bartlett and Suzanne Armstrong made plans to move into a small terrace house at 147 Easy Street Collingwood. This suburb was a cheaper one at the time because it was a rougher neighborhood. It wasn't necessarily dangerous because it was definitely an up and coming neighborhood, but it just wasn't as safe as some other parts of Melbourne at the time. But Armstrong and Bartlett were both so excited. They were best friends and so the thought of living together was just so exciting. And on top of this, Bartlett loved loved kids. She worked with them for a living so the fact that she was moving in with Armstrong and her little baby boy Greg was just something that she knew she was going to enjoy. Armstrong also felt like this was the perfect match because if she had a roommate it meant that she was able to afford a place in Melbourne off her government payments that she received for being a single mom. As Armstrong had Greg, Bartlett felt like she needed a little companion as well and so she bought a little puppy by the name of Mishka. And so in October of 1976, Bartlett, Armstrong, Greg and Mishka moved into the little terrace house at 147 Easy Street, Collingwood. The two Sues were thrilled to be living together and they had also made really good friends with their neighbours. Like I said, this was a terrace house and so they shared a wall with these two young women. One was named Alona Stevens and the other one, I couldn't find her name anywhere so for the sake of this video, we will call her Kylie. Gladys Coventry also lived 
on the other side of Armstrong and Bartlett, but in like a separate house. And she was in her late 70s at the time. And Gladys was someone who was very much into her community. Back in these times and in early January, houses didn't really have air cons, so it was really, really hot. And so Gladys would really struggle to sleep. And so many nights she would sit up late just looking out of her window and watching what was happening in all the other houses. Gladys kind of felt responsible to watch out her window as she knew this neighborhood wasn't always the safest and she was almost like a community watch type person. And from her window, she could actually see into the back of Bartlett and Armstrong's house. Basically where their kitchen was is where she could see directly straight into. Armstrong and Bartlett were social people who loved to have their friends over. Susan Bartlett had just started seeing a new man. He was a tobacco salesman whose name also has never really been revealed. So we'll call him Tom. And Tom was over at Easy Street very often. Suzanne Armstrong also started seeing someone who was a sheep shearer by the name of Barry Woodard. Armstrong was so happy to have met someone who seemed interested in her and as well as this he seemed really invested in her child. She was a bit scarred from the experience that she'd had with Greg's dad Elias but she told Bartlett that she had a really good feeling about this guy. He was actually the brother of her younger sister's boyfriend so she knew a little bit about him already and she felt like she could trust this guy. Both ladies saw their boyfriends every other day and would chat every other day as well. We've got to remember that this was quite a long time ago in the 70s and there was no social media so it's not like you could be talking all the time but they definitely talked quite often. So on the day of January 10th 1977 it was just another regular day like any other day. Bartlett saw her mum Elaine in the day and they went shopping together and they had lunch together and then that night Bartlett had actually invited over her brother whose name was Martin Bartlett and she would invited him over for dinner but also she'd invited him over because she had a broken radio that she really wanted him to fix for her and so he came over at 7 p.m. he fixed the radio had dinner and he left between 9 and 9 30 p.m. that night. This is when things started to get a little bit strange. The following morning Alona Stevens who was the neighbor woke up to the sounds of Greg crying and she didn't think too much of it at the time because she was pretty hungover and she heard Greg crying from time to time anyway. Alona had gone out the previous night with a work friend who was called John and he had actually stayed over. I think they were just friends because he stayed on her couch and she obviously stayed in her room and stuff but John was known to be a bit of a dodgy man. He was known to be a big drinker and he didn't have that many friends. A lot of people tried to avoid him because he'd actually been a suspect two years prior in the Julie Ann Garcia Soleil case which was a case involving the disappearance of Julie. John was one of the last people to be with her along with two other males but had always denied involvement in the case and sadly Julie's body had never been found. But on the morning of January 11th, once Alona got up, she drove John home. When she returned to her townhouse, her flatmate Kylie had told her that she'd noticed Bartlett's dog Mishka running around outside the front of the house. The ladies caught the dog, but after knocking on the Sue's doors, no one answered. And so they decided that they would just keep Mishka with them for a little while until either of the Sue's returned home. After this, Alona then went about her day. But when she came home in the evening, she thought it was strange that Mishka was still over at her house. Neither Suzanne Armstrong or Susan Bartlett had come over to pick her up. And because of this, she decided to leave a note on the door. The next day, January 12th, came and went and again they heard nothing and Alona noticed that the note that she had left remained on the door. By Thursday January 13th Alona Stevens and Kylie decided that it was time to go over to the house and see what was going on. They were really worried because they both heard Greg crying over the past few days and so they just had a feeling that something wasn't quite right. Their suspicions were confirmed when they walked into Armstrong and Bartlett's house via their open back door to find Susan Bartlett lying lifeless at the front door. The scene was graphic. Bartlett had blood all around her and they could see multiple stab wounds all over her body. And it wasn't long before the ladies found Susan Armstrong as well. She was lying lifeless on her bed. Her nightie was pushed up above her waist and she also had stab wounds all over her body. Alona and Kylie were relieved to find Greg alive in his cot in his own room. And because of all of this, they obviously called the police. Now, at first, 
the police actually thought that this was a prank call and they only sent over one officer but when the officer went in he realized it wasn't a prank call and quite a few police followed very quickly after that. Now this investigation didn't get off to the best start. Police didn't actually tape off the crime scene which meant that a lot of different people's DNA contaminated the scene and the thing was it wouldn't be until the 80s when DNA testing became more of a common thing but police still knew to collect the DNA and preserve it or at least most police knew to do that these police obviously Basically, the police should have tried to retrieve items before opening up the scene to different investigators. What they could test for though at the time was blood type. There was a lot of blood on the ladies as well as in the bathroom. Police actually believed that the killer had cleaned a lot of blood off Armstrong and Bartlett after they had passed away and used the bathroom sink to do this. This blood in the bathroom couldn't be used though because one of the investigators had used that sink to wash his hands and so it was was contaminated. Police also spoke with some neighbours on the night of the incident and Gladys Commentary, the older lady who lived next door to 147 Easy Street, had something very interesting to say. Late on the night of the 10th, Gladys had seen a man in Bartlett and Armstrong's kitchen washing up what looked like to be clothes in the kitchen sink. She said he appeared really calm and he was there quite a while washing up and so she got a pretty good look at his face while he was doing it. Police though didn't really take her that seriously when she told them this. They didn't take an official statement and this really offended Gladys. She felt like police had looked past her because of her older age and so a few days later when police came back to try and get an official statement she was not having a bar of it. Police even tried to send out one of their personnel poised as a elderly welfare checkup type person to try and get information out of Gladys that way but she was a pretty smart woman and she caught on pretty quick and so she was giving them nothing. But you guys I don't know how I feel about Gladys because at the end of the day people died and are you really going to put your pride in front of giving police information even though police definitely made a mistake in this. I don't know there's just something about that that doesn't sit right with me. When Armstrong and Bartlett's bodies were further examined police found that Armstrong had 27 stab wounds all over her body and Bartlett had 55. Police were baffled as to how this had happened. Alona and Kylie next door hadn't heard anything. The house didn't look as if it had been broken into and everything inside the house looked like it was where it was meant to be also. Police thought that surely these ladies would have tried to fight if some random intruder had come into their home and the thing was Bartlett actually did have wounds on her body that were consistent with what you would have if you were fighting someone but Armstrong didn't and because of this fact police believed that Armstrong was probably the more likely of the two to have been the person to know the intruder. It was also apparent because of Suzanne Armstrong's pushed up nighty and the fact that she had bodily fluids found on her that she had been raped after she passed away and I think again because it was her and not Bartlett police were led to believe that she was the one who knew the intruder. Police did find some interesting evidence though at the crime scene. On the bed of Susan Bartlett there was a muddy footprint and police were pretty interested to work out whose foot this footprint belonged to. The footprint owner actually came forwards and it was none other than Bartlett's boyfriend Tom the tobacco guy. His story was that he had been calling the house phone for a few days and by Tuesday the 11th when he had still had no answer him and his friend had decided to go over to the house to see if they had the right phone number. It was pretty late on Tuesday the 11th. I believe they'd been out drinking so maybe he had a bit of liquid courage which is why he thought it was a good idea to go over there uninvited. But either way Tom said that he jumped through Bartlett's window and he made his way to the lounge room to read the little home phone number on the actual phone to see if it was correct. The lounge room was also at the back of the house and both Armstrong and Greg's rooms were at the front so it was Armstrong, Greg and then Bartlett's room and then the lounge rooms 
were at the back. So if this story is true, Tom would not have had to walk past either of the bodies to get to the lounge room because they were both at the front of the house. And he also exited back out of Bartlett's window. So again, he wouldn't have had to go to the front of the house, but it does make you wonder how he got in and out of there without hearing Greg or waking Greg up. But I think the fact that he was the one to go to the police and also the fact he had an alibi who was that guy that he went to the house with were two reasons why police believed his story and they let him go. As I had said previously, Suzanne Armstrong had recently started dating a man by the name of Barry Woodard and police actually found a handwritten note within the house from Barry saying that he had tried to call her multiple times without answer. When Barry was questioned about this note, he said that he and his brother had gone to the house on the night of the 12th to see why none of his calls to Armstrong had been returned. It was late when they went to the house and they could see a light on in the back kitchen area, but they couldn't hear any noise coming from within the house. Barry's brother wanted to go into the house and see what was going on and so Barry reluctantly agreed. He didn't really want to be caught snooping around or anything, but the brothers went up the back stairs and into the back kitchen and that is where they left the note. They did not go any further into the house and right after leaving the note they also left. According to these men's story, neither of them saw either of the ladies' bodies and neither of them saw or heard Greg either and police believed their story. There was a third suspect that police were interested in, Alona Stevens' friend and co-worker John. John had been staying next door to Armstrong and Bartlett on the night of their murders and the fact that he had been one of the last people to see Julie Ann Garcia Seeley before she went missing two years prior meant that police were very interested in talking to him. He was questioned for a full day and has always maintained his innocence and police had no real evidence to put him at the crime scene anyway. This case originally had massive media attention but the thing was unfortunately there was no new leads really and so it only took a few weeks for media outlets to lose interest. And honestly not a lot has really happened with this case since that time. DNA testing has really advanced though and for now all three of the men that I mentioned along with five other suspects have actually been cleared. Suzanne Armstrong's baby boy Greg went to live with her sister who has adopted him as her own and I believe her brother also played a really big role in raising Greg too. But that brings me to the end of this case. I personally feel like this is just such a confusing one. Like there's so many questions I have that just don't make sense. Like how did neither of those two men wake up Greg or hear him or how did like he not be disturbed by them when they went in? It just is so confusing to me. How did neither of those men see the bodies? And what about the dog Mishka? Why did she make no noise? Or why did no one hear her when the two Sues were being attacked? I will link Crime Stoppers below though. If anyone watching has any information, feel free to follow that link. And also feel free to comment below what your theories on this case are. I would be so curious to know what you guys think about this case. But as always, you guys, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye you guys.